I don't know about you, but I find myself singing in the course of the week some of these choruses and hymns and things that we sing. You know, the Bible says that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. And we know that scripture teaches us that where two or three are gathered together in his name, he's present with us. But there's something about that habitation with God's people. We're singing to him. We're giving him praise, not singing to each other. And it's a wonderful thing as God blesses that and uses that. I want to invite you to open your Bible with me to the book of Lamentations this morning. Lamentations chapter 3, an Old Testament book following the book of Jeremiah. In fact, most scholars believe that Jeremiah wrote this book of Lamentations that we're going to be looking at. In a moment, I'm going to read verses 1 through 24, so I encourage you to follow along with me if you have your Bible or maybe your phone or whatever you might use that has God's Word, I encourage you to follow with me. During the pandemic of COVID-19 in 2020, Max Lucado developed a series of messages for Christian television that were actually based on his book entitled, You'll Get Through This. The book was a book about the life of Joseph and the various struggles that Joseph walked through and the difficulties that he experienced during that time. It really was a lesson on endurance. In fact, he developed a little saying that he used in each one of those messages, and I want to share it with you this morning. He said it this way, you'll get through this. It won't be painless. It won't be quick, but God will use this mess for good. In the meantime, don't be foolish or naive, but don't despair either. With God's help, you will get through this. You know, every one of us need endurance. We're going to make it in this life, and if we're going to move forward, we need to understand a little bit about receiving endurance and how we receive it from God. I'm amazed at how both the Old Testament and the New Testament writers speak about this very issue. It wasn't unusual, if you've read the Psalms, to find David crying out to God and asking God for help in various situations and different kinds of needs that he was experiencing. The Apostle Paul, I've often thought, must have been an athlete somewhere along the way because he uses athletic terms and he uses the terms perseverance and endurance and running the race and what it means to run the race and be involved in the competition that is ongoing. We are told to run that race with patience and with endurance. Endurance simply means staying power that we have the ability to stand up under the load that we have endured in the face of different kinds of difficulties so the question comes today how do you endure when you're experiencing a lengthy illness how do you endure when you're facing unjust treatment how do you endure when you are misunderstood how do you endure when you walk through a divorce? How do you endure when you experience a financial loss or a financial setback? How do you go forward and how do you endure at the loss of a loved one? We all walk through these various kinds of experiences. And sometimes we just assume that being a Christian, we just need to kind of pass our feelings along and go on forward and move through whatever experience we may be dealing with. Job says it best in his book. He says, man is but a few days old and the sparks fly upwards. I've always thought that that's a great definition of life because we really don't know from one day to the next what life is going to bring. The best laid plans and efforts that you have today may seem like a failure tomorrow or maybe in the future. So we understand, especially in the Christian experience, that if we're going to live victorious and persevere, we need to understand something about endurance. Jeremiah understood something about endurance 
endurance. In fact, the Bible uh, speaks so eloquently, and, and Jeremiah shares with us his heart in this passage of Scripture this morning. He has been called the weeping prophet. Now, the book of Lamentations is all about the results of Babylon's destruction of Jerusalem in 587 B.C. Jeremiah not only expresses his personal experience through these destructive days, but he also talks about the nation and the judgment of God on that nation as a, an eyewitness testimony, an eyewitness account. Jeremiah, as an individual member of that nation, was expressing his grief over the destruction of Jerusalem. But in a very real sense, he was expressing his complaints to God in the midst of everything else that was going on. You see, Jeremiah was a whole lot like you and I and a lot of people. He could not believe that God had chosen to use a pagan nation like Babylon to take judgment upon God's people. And yet, you and I understand that God judges sin. Many people today have simply assumed that God will never judge America. After all, hasn't America been a blessing to the nations? Hasn't America been built on a Christian foundation? And yet, we look all around us today and we see the erosion of that Christian commitment. And we understand that God does not tolerate sin. He's patient. He's long-suffering. And yet the Bible is very clear that God judges sin. So we do we just assume that maybe God will never judge America because of her sin? And go on our way as though we're going to live free and we're going to be a people who do what we want to do forever? Or does God allow a pagan nation to bring judgment on America? And here's the second thought. Would God ever allow his people to also go through that judgment when he judges a nation for her sin. Well, that's exactly what we see here in Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet that was called of God, and he was called to prophesy judgment to the nation, but the people would not hear it. They would not listen to it. So therefore, when God began to bring judgment through a pagan nation, not only was that pagan nation or that, that group of people that were called the people of God affected, but even those like Jeremiah who were trying to obey God, faced the same judgment. They faced the same kind of issues that were, were taking place at that time. Listen in Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 18. Here's what Jeremiah said to God. Why did I come out of the womb to see toil and sorrow and to spend my days in shame? Jeremiah had seen and had gone through this trouble. He had predicted this kind of trouble. He would have been utterly confused if God had not spoken to him in the way he spoke to him and brought him around. But there's good news. We not only see gloom and doom in this third chapter, we see the offering of hope. And in that offering of hope, we recognize that it is probably the most hopeful picture that we could ever see. Not just for the day that Jeremiah lived, but for our day also. I want to read this passage of Scripture. And it is a little lengthy, so you follow along with me as I read it, beginning at verse 1. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He's made my flesh and my skin waste away. He's broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. 
He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with blocks of stones and has made my paths crooked. He is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and he tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He bent his bow and sent me as a target for his arrow. He drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. I have become a laughingstock of all peoples, the object of their taunts all day long. He's filled me with bitterness and has sated me with wormwood. He's made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereaved of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wonderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it, and it is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. I don't think we have a stronger testimony from anyone of Scripture. About one who feels that God has abandoned them. That God has taken judgment on their lives. And here Jeremiah is a prophet. Someone who has attempted to do the will of God by preaching and communicating and sharing with the nation. Attempting in every way to help them come to their senses. But there's this overwhelming feeling that he is a total failure. There's this overwhelming feeling that not only has he not done what God has called him to do, but now God is taking judgment upon him just like he's taking judgment upon the people who have sinned and gone away from God. And in that sense, he is not only feeling the pressure upon his own heart and upon his own life, but he's feeling that he's wasted his life. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt at some point that you've sought to do what you feel is the will of God and it only turns sour? Have you ever walked into the experience of life and say, I would have never dreamed this would have ever happened to me? Have you ever felt at times that God does not hear your prayer, that God does not understand what you're going through, and by the way, that God doesn't even care anymore? about you I would imagine that there are not only people in secular society that feel that way but the people of God that some way feel that very way in their own minds and in their own hearts today abandoned left alone pushed aside pushed in failure I want you to consider some of these verses with me before we move into this outline to understand the depths of what Jeremiah is feeling. He says in verses 2 and 3 that the hand of God's wrath is upon him. And he makes this statement, instead of walking in the light as he had once done with God, he is now stumbling around in the darkness. He doesn't seem to believe that there's any real guidance. So therefore, why should he even consider what God would have him to do? He's stumbling in the midst of it all because God has turned his hand on him. 
verse 4, he experiences both the outward pain and the inward bitterness that he has in his own life. Jeremiah really is a broken person. He's broken in body, but he's also broken in spirit. He really doesn't have any desire to continue forward and to move. In verse 7, he speaks of being walled in. Some translations use the word hedged in. In other words, it's a form of torture that was used by the Assyrians. They would confine a prisoner to a certain amount of space. You and I might look at that today as as solitary confinement. Where a person is put into a cell block and there are no chairs. There's nothing in there. They're just walled in by themselves. But Jeremiah says he's confined to this space. There's no way out. There's no possible escape. And he says, it doesn't even seem as though God hears my prayers. He's not answering my prayers at all. And then in verse 10, he says, God is like a lion. God is like a bear. He hunts him down. He shreds him to pieces. He says in verse 12 that he takes his bow and an arrow And Jeremiah says, I become like target practice. He shoots his arrows toward me. But if that were not enough, all of a sudden, he turns his attention to saying, God, you have made me a laughing stock of the nations. Most of us understand the feeling of that kind of rejection when people write us off. And they feel we're of no value and no use any longer. And regardless of what our efforts have been, all of a sudden, we feel like they're behind us. They're laughing. They're mocking. They're ridiculing. Jeremiah had been a prophet to the nation to speak God's word. But now, in the midst of all that's going on, they're laughing at him. They're mocking him. No wonder Jeremiah would have said, I cursed the day that I was born. God, why did you bring me out to experience this kind of pain and this kind of suffering to make me a laughing stock? In verse 15, he uses the word wormwood. Wormwood is a bitter plant which actually became a symbol of calamity. In other words, there's all kinds of things going on in Jeremiah's life. It's not just on one front. It's on every front of his life. It's on multiple issues that he's facing. Have you ever felt that way? That you're facing multiple issues in life. And you're struggling along the way. He uses in verse 16, gravel. And he says it this way. And let me read it one more time to you there in verse 16. He's made my teeth grind on gravel. What happened is, is they would mix sand with food and as a punishment for a convict or someone that had broken the law, they would make them eat sand in, in food. Now, I know there's probably a lot of children here that have eaten some mud pies before and maybe, maybe you've eaten some mud pies, but can you imagine trying to survive and grinding your teeth? In reading this passage of scripture, I came across one scholar who said that the mummified bodies of Egyptians evidenced the fact that some of these Egyptians had been punished because their teeth were ground down from eating food that had been mixed with sand. So Jeremiah has brought these accusations to God and said, God, you've made me eat gravel. I'm trying to do your will. Verse 17 gives us evidence that there was no real peace in his soul. How could there be peace in his soul facing all of the kinds of things that he's facing? There was trouble. There was trial. There was difficulty. And he's crying out to God in the midst of it. There's no peace in his soul. Verse 18, he speaks about endurance that has perished and that is a hopeless kind of sign look at that verse with me again so i say my endurance has perished so has my hope from the lord well i can't think of any more uh, telling testimony than than a a prophet of god who's standing up and saying you know (laughs) i've done everything that i can do 
God has not intervened. There's not anything that's going to change this. I'm in misery. I find no peace of soul. God, you've used me and made me a laughing stock. And yet, in verse 19, he once again says, Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall, the calamity. And we don't understand a little bit about this word gall. That was a poisonous herb. You'll remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross. Matthew chapter 27 records it. And he said, I thirst. And those soldiers standing below him mixed gall with a liquid to try to hand it to Jesus. Or at least put it up to Jesus on a towel. Sopped it in order to quench his thirst. And Jesus refused it. That kind of bitter, bitterness that he says, I, I've, I've received that gall and, and that wormwood in the midst of everything going on. He says in verse 20, my soul continually remembers it and it is bowed down within me. That's Jeremiah's way of saying to you and me, I'm done. I'm done. There's nothing else, God, that I can do. I'm broken. I'm broken physically. I'm broken emotionally. I'm broken spiritually. Does a Christian come to that point in life when they reach that kind of brokenness? For most of us, it's easy to smile at times. It's easy when things are going good. To feel we're committed, we're dedicated, all that we're trying to do is being blessed. But what about the other time for a believer in Jesus Christ? When life seems to have soured. When there doesn't seem to be any emotion in the tank any longer. Doesn't seem to really be any love. Surely not any joy, certainly not any peace. How do you endure? I want you to notice, as I've said a moment ago in this third chapter, the most hopeful two verses in this entire book of the Bible. Look at it with me in verse 21. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases his mercies never come to an end they are new every morning great is your faithfulness the Lord is my portion says my soul therefore I will hope in him Jeremiah is saying against all visible evidence Against the way I'm feeling. And that's our danger. Many times we try to live by feelings. He's saying against all of the things that I've already complained to God about. I will remember his promises. I will remember his word. Now I want you to notice as you follow in your outline. Number one. Remember his covenant loyalties. Whatever you're walking through today, whatever may have been your experience, whatever may be your grief, whatever may be your doubt, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you are in covenant with God. Maybe you say, well, you know, I, I, the Old Testament covenant of Deuteronomy chapter 28 was a covenant made with Israel, with the nation of Israel, and you're exactly right. That was a covenant made with Israel. God's protection. He will judge them, but God will finish his work that he has planned for Israel. He will do it one day. But those of us who know Christ as a personal Savior, we are in covenant. When we take the Lord's Supper, we take the juice. We eat the body. Both of those are symbols. But what are they symbols of? They're symbols of a covenant that was made. Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, you do it in remembrance 
of me. You remember my covenant to you. Now, the Hebrew word that is used here in verse 21 is the word hesed. It's loving kindness. It's loyal devotion. And it's loyal devotion in a particular relationship. It is loyal devotion in a covenant relationship whose author is God. And he will not break his covenant. He will not break his covenant. I want you to notice that God is not removed from his people. Sometimes we think he is. Sometimes we feel that way. You and your circumstances may make you feel that way. But here's the promise of scripture. I will never leave you nor will I forsake you. That's what God says to every believer in Jesus Christ. I'm not going to abandon you. Yes, you look out there and you think the details of life are difficult. I'm here. I have a plan for your life. In his sovereignty, God has a purpose and a plan for your life and for my life. Not only that, but God remains faithful to his promises. This is his covenant. There is not word of his promises that he has failed yet. He's not going to fail his promises. His word does not change. You know, the culture that we live in changes all the time. In fact, it's every morning it's changing right now. God's word is steadfast. He does not change. He says to you and to me, I love you. I've not left you. I've not abandoned you. My promises are true. Look, if you would, at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. Here's what the scripture says. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That's why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. All of his promises, not just a part of them, all of his promises are true. All of his promises are yes in Jesus Christ. Jeremiah said, I turn my mind toward that covenant God. Although I've experienced all these things and do not understand, I'm trusting in you. I'm putting my hope in you. Secondly, remember that endurance comes from the Lord. Endurance comes from the Lord. Endurance is not achieved by working harder. And I know that's difficult for you to to listen to coming from a Baptist preacher because... We want to put people to work and get them going and and make them work and do what they need to do. And there's nothing wrong with being active in church and working. But there are just some things that you're not going to work harder and it's going to get better. It's not about the doing in this situation. It's about the being in this situation. It's about being in relationship with the God of all creation. The God who created you. The God who knows you. The God who has a purpose for your life. It's not trying to do something extra for him to earn his merit so that you can gain his favor. You have his favor in Jesus. He's blessed you. He took your sins on the cross. You are in covenant with God. Endurance is not achieved by working harder. In fact, I'll tell you this right now. It only leads to greater frustration. It leads to greater frustration trying to do something harder in our own strength. But here it is. Endurance is provided because of his faithfulness. That's what Jeremiah says to you and to me. He goes down through all that he's done, all that he's been accused of. Now all that God has done to him. But he says, I'm reminded of the fact that I'm in covenant with God. Great is his faithfulness to me. Great is his faithfulness to me. He has provided his faithfulness to me. And when I'm willing to stop in my life and to acknowledge him and to trust him and to allow him to do the work that he wants to do in my life, he demonstrates that faithfulness to me. But finally, I want you to notice that we're to remember that God finishes what he starts. 
That's what Jeremiah is saying to you and to me this morning that you're not just someone that God has forgotten about and left out in the cold. He knows you. He knows you intimately. He understands you more than you could ever understand yourself. And Jeremiah discovers that. Outward trouble and inward turmoil will bring despair. It's going to bring despair for your life and for my life. Circumstances can really get you down. They will sap you. They will take your strength. And they will take your endurance. That's why it's so critical that we understand we're to remind ourselves of this great covenant God who gives mercy. And the Bible says it's not leftover mercy. What does it say? It is fresh And it is new every day. It's like the manna that God gave to the children of Israel when they were crossing the desert. They didn't have to worry about saving up from yesterday. They didn't have to worry whether or not God was not going to provide for them the next day. Now they did and they complained a whole lot. But God provided for them. Day by day. And that's exactly how he will take care of you. You don't have to go wandering down the road into next month or next year or the next decade or whatever it is. You have to remind yourself once again you're in covenant with God. And his mercies are fresh and new every day. Maybe today you're thinking I don't have the strength to go on. I don't want to go on. I don't have the strength to stay in that job. I don't have the strength to stay in that marriage. I don't have the endurance I need. You come to that point to remind yourself once again. You're in covenant with God. You're in relationship with God. What you cannot do. He can. What you're willing to allow him to do. He will. He will. But I want you to notice finally. Because of God's loyal love. He will complete his work in you. You may not understand all the purposes of God. Most of us don't. There's some mysteries in our lives. Some things we don't understand why. The amazing thing is that God has promised. Listen to this promise. Job chapter 23 and verse 14. He says... For he will complete what he appoints for me. And many such things are in his mind. My favorite verse on this subject is Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. He says, and I'm sure of this. That he who began a good work in you. Will bring it to completion. At the day of Jesus Christ. That good work that God started in your life however many years ago, he's still working in you. He's not stopped. Maybe you've put him on the back burner somewhere. Maybe you've kind of shoved the work of God off somewhere. But listen, God's still at work in your life. There's going to be some trials and there's going to be some troubles. Sometimes those get our attention and bring us back to a center focus on God. But you're his. You're his possession. The Bible says you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people separated unto God. That's what God thinks about you. He's not going to cast you off. He's not going to sideline you somewhere. At another church I was pastoring, a family came to join our church and they actually came out of the pastorate. The husband was the pastor. Uh, He had a wife and two small children. I learned later after visiting with him that he had been fired from the church that he had been pastoring. They sought our church out. They found fellowship in the church. There were people that loved and encouraged them. And yet that stigma of being fired stuck in his heart and in his mind. Why would God allow this? Why would the people of God be this way? Why could they be so heartless? A lot of questions, a lot of fellowship, a lot of talking. The young man got involved in the church and began to teach a Sunday school class after a period of time. And then later on, after having been faithful in that Sunday school class, 
God opened a door for him to go back into the pastorate, back into the ministry. But he had to be willing to run the risk. The difficulty there was, is God, why weren't you there in the middle of all this other stuff going on? The answer is God was there. God was there. God's teaching and God's instruction and God's working in our hearts and our lives may be mystery to you and to me. But never forget, he's not going to give up on you. In fact, I want to just remind you today that God is not through with you until you breathe your last breath. Did you know that? Sometimes people feel like that they're no good to anybody any longer. It's just not true. Until God takes you home as believer in Jesus Christ, he's got a plan. He's got a purpose. But maybe, even maybe today, you've got to come to this point to say, God, I have forgotten you. I have made this about me and not about you. Now you take over in my life. Because your promise is that your mercies are fresh and new every day. Great is your faithfulness. I want you to bow your heads in prayer with me. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the truth of your word that there's not one Word and one promise that has failed. We failed, but not you, Lord. Use your word to speak to our hearts and lives today to draw us closer to Jesus. For it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. We're going to stand. And-